Okay. Well, this morning then we're going to continue in our series in the book of John, the gospel according to John. And uh, we've completed chapter one after four sessions. And uh, we're coming into this, the second chapter now. And uh, we're starting to look at some of the miracles of Jesus called signs. And the first one, of course, is the water being turned into wine. Now, just to give you a, 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 just a, a refresher, what this book is about, so that we just know what John is trying to communicate through his gospel, is this. Um, that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And if we believe in him, we will have eternal life. He said, that's why I write these things to you. So he starts by saying, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh. In other words, Jesus, who is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, added to his deity a human nature as well. Didn't cease being God, but added a human nature to himself so that he could come and be a substitute for the human race, to give his life a ransom for many. And uh, John the Baptist Proclaim, behold, the Lamb of God. That's why he came, to be the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God, the substitute who would take away the sin of the world. And uh, so now we come to the second chapter where John has selected seven different miracles, seven miracles, which he calls signs that attest to the deity of Christ. Okay, the glory of Christ, that he is the Son of God. These signs manifest his glory. Okay, uh, so they don't just tell us some miracles that happen, but there's an aspect of his glory that we see in each one of them. For example, uh, we know that he multiplied the loaves and the fishes. Now, that's not just to meet our needs, showing that he can meet our needs, but showing that he is the bread of heaven. Because you remember they, they wanted to keep following him because they wanted him to do it again. Keep doing it again. Turn the, 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 the loaves and the fishes, multiply them so that we can be fed. And he said, no, seek rather the bread that comes down from heaven. Because if you eat this bread, you will never be hungry again. The bread of life. And then, of course, he, um, he healed a man that was born blind. Uh, but... He went on to say and teach from that, that he is the light of the world. Just as he gave light to that man, so those who believe in him no longer walk in darkness, but are the light of God, walk in the light of God. Amen. Then he healed Lazarus. Now, he raised him rather from the dead. He could have healed him, but he didn't heal him. He waited a few days for him to die. He heard that he was sick, but he didn't go into the uh, town of Bethany to, raise, to heal him until he died. Why is that? Because he wanted to demonstrate that he is the resurrection and the life, that he conquered death. We don't have to fear death because he is the resurrection. And um, praise God for that. Amen. So all these signs illustrate some aspect of his glory. That's what I'm saying. So we're coming to the first sign, the turning of the water into wine. And what does that illustrate? The first miracle of Jesus in John's gospel signified that Jesus had come to replace the cold, dead formalism of the old covenant with the life and the joy of the new covenant. Now, one of the things that, made, uh, uh, that is made prominent in John's introduction to his gospel in chapter 1 is the failure of Judaism and religion. Okay, in other words, he's showing, look, you know, this doesn't do it for us. Religion is there, but you won't find God in religion. You won't find what you're looking for in religion. Jesus did not come to start another religion. He said, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. So in chapter one, we see how Judaism and religion fail. For example, the, the fact that the priests and the Levites sent someone from Jerusalem to inquire of John who he was. Now, if they were really in touch with God, they would have known. Their scriptures said, he is the one who's come to prepare the way for the Messiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You remember? It says that in Malachi. It says that in Isaiah. They would have known if they were true leaders of God's people. And they would have been able to 
explain that to the people. And then John's statement to them, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there, one stand, there stands one among you whom you do not know. The Messiah that all the scriptures pointed to, the whole nation of Israel were waiting for, he had come, but they did not know him. The leaders did not know him. They were blind leaders of the blind. It was time to set aside the old covenant and to bring in what the Bible calls a better hope, that of the new covenant, which Jesus ushered in. The law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. You remember Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said that um, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. That time had come. Jesus has come. And so the old covenant was now obsolete because the new covenant was going to replace it. As uh, Jesus said, the law and the prophets were until John. John was the cutoff point. Demonstrating that that's the end of that period. That period has come to a conclusion. And it's illustrated by the fact that we saw last week that um, two of the disciples of Jesus left John to follow Jesus. When John said that's the Lamb of God, they left him, left John and followed Jesus. And John had no problem with that because he knew that he'd come to prepare the way for Jesus and that his ministry had been fulfilled. So let's just summarize the miracle first of all. Jesus and six of his disciples came to a wedding. Why six? I don't know. Maybe the other six were grounded. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> no, probably they were not called at this time. He only had six disciples, or maybe these six disciples knew the couple that were getting married. The others didn't, so they weren't invited. But six of his disciples were there with him. Now, we need to understand this, that weddings were major social occasions in Israel. Okay? Then that, that were, I mean, they are in our society, right? But more so in Israel, because... It, it's not like we have here, you know, you have the ceremony, then you have the reception, and then the couple go away on their honeymoon. Now, it's not like that. Basically, the wedding ceremony, or the wedding celebration, I should say, went on for days, sometimes seven days. Seven days, can you imagine that? So people were constantly coming and going. Different guests coming to celebrate and to enjoy the festivity, and to go again. So there were great social occasions and, and the host, it was his time or opportunity to impress the guests, to put on a lavish spread so that everyone would remember they had a good time at that wedding. Afterwards, they would all talk about it. Wasn't that a great time? And that was like the honor of the family that put on the wedding. So you need to understand that. So at this wedding, all eyes were on the host to see whether he would excel or disappoint. Because either way, he'd be talked about. <laughs> okay. And what happened? They ran out of wine. They ran. I mean, that was just like the unthinkable. The servants realized that they were out of wine. So... Running out of wine would, bring, uh, wine would bring public shame to their social standing. Can you, did you hear what happened to that wedding? They actually ran out of wine. What did you drink? Water. <laughs> That's a bit, pretty much an anticlimax, isn't it? So Jesus asked him to help and he told them to fill six water pots with water, each containing 20 to 30 gallons. Now, um, a gallon... So it's basically one water pot, let's just put it this way. If, you look, if you're thinking in terms of litres, which we do, probably around at least 100 litres in each water pot. They were big water pots. So there were six of them, over 600 litres, right? He tells the servants to fill all of them up with water. And as they served, they were commanded to serve the water, it became wine. As they poured it, it was not water but wine. The, the ruler of the feast, the one in charge of all the, you know, the uh, arrangements commented that this wine was better than the wine they had in the beginning, which was the reverse way of what usually happens. Usually they sell, uh, serve the best wine first and then when people are a little bit sort of, uh, shall we say, tipsy, then they can bring out the other stuff. <laughs> but the ruler said, this is the best wine, you've saved it till last. Okay. 
So let's have a look at, see that as the water is being poured, it turns into wine. That was the miracle. Okay, what is it teaching? Wine in the scripture is a picture of joy. For example, just choosing one verse, Psalm 104 verse 15 says, and wine that makes glad the heart of man. So it's a symbol of rejoicing and, and happiness and, and, and celebration and joy. Religion and religious people do not bring joy. I don't know if you noticed that. When, you know, when, when, when you're in, if you're in a company of people and they're all having a good time and they're, they're, they're happy, and then a, a religious person comes in with that kind of sanctimonious look, which says, I've just come out of the presence of God and he does not approve of this lightheartedness. <laughs> have, you, have you been in a situation like that? I, I, I have, I have. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but you know, joy, joy is different to happiness. I understand that. Happiness is circumstantial. So if, you, if, you, if things are going well in your life, you're happy. In fact, it comes from an old English word, hap, hap. Your hap, what, how is, what is your hap today? What's happening in your life, that means? If, if what is happening is good, then you're happy. That's where that word comes from. But joy is not based on circumstances. Amen? Joy is, is based on your relationship with God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Though the fig tree may not blossom, there be no fruit on the vine, the produce of the olive fell, and there be no herds in the stall, etc., etc. Yet we will rejoice in the Lord, because the fruit of the Spirit is joy. So people that cannot smile and cannot be happy and, and joyful, that want to impress me that they are spiritual at the same time, well, they might fool others, but they don't fool me. If you've been in the presence of Jesus, you have joy in your life. Amen. And, 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 and praise God, you know, it's not based on circumstances. It's not. You, you have that joy with you all the time. You know, sometimes I'm driving down the road. You ever seen those signs if, you, if you're going through, like, um, roadworks and, and they bring the, the, the speed limit down? Maybe it's usually 100, but now you've got to go to 80. So you've got to slow down and you go through. And then there's this sign, you know, the smiley face. If you, if you, if you keep within the 80 kilometers, the green smiley face comes up. I smile back. It doesn't cost you anything to smile, does it? I even talk to it. I talk to it. Because sometimes it comes up red and I go, what, me or you? No, seriously. I mean, joy is, is not based on circumstances. Things might not be good in your life, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen? And, and religious people don't have that. In fact, they're killjoys. They're killjoys. They're party poopers. At this wedding, they would have all been standing in a corner drinking cordial, <laughs> criticizing the sipping saints. Well, Jesus was a sipping saint. I'm, I'm, if that offends you, I'm sorry. That, that's the fact of the matter. They criticized John because he hardly ate anything. Why, locusts and wild honey. They said, he's got a demon. That's not, that's not normal. That guy's got a demon. And then Jesus, the Bible says, came eating and drinking. And they said, he's gluttonous and a wine bibber. A wine bibber means one who habitually drinks wine. Doesn't get drunk. I didn't say that. Jesus would never get drunk. He would never be out of control but he enjoyed the joy of wine. Amen? He turned the water into wine. You know, religious people would wish that he turned the wine into water. But I'm sorry, he turned the water into wine. All right? All right, let's look here, because John is trying to share something with us here. There were six stone jars that normally held water. What was that for? These are these big, why would they need such big pots, you know, jars rather, of water? For the ceremonial cleansing, the washing of the hands and feet. You know all about that. Jesus was criticized for it because he and his disciples didn't do it. Mark 7 verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. As I've shared before, it's got nothing to do with hygiene. 
It was to do with the fact that if they uh, had, had, had sort of accidentally touched something that a Gentile had touched, they were unclean. And so they had to wash their hands to wash the uncleanness of the Gentiles off of them. That was what we call here the tradition of the elders. What's the tradition of the elders? The, tra the elders or the scribes, during the period between the Old and the New Testament, try to interpret the law. There are 600 plus laws in the Old Testament. How are we to understand those? We'll explain them to you. So, you know, the more legalistic you become, you need laws to explain laws to explain laws. Is that right? So they, they wrote thousands of laws, especially regarding the Sabbath, what you could do and what you could not do on the Sabbath. There were, for example, somebody said, can, am I allowed to tie my knot on the sandal strap? Ah, you can, tie, you can tie a knot on your sandal strap or even on your water skin, your water bottle, but you cannot tie a bigger knot than that. You cannot tie a sailor's knot, okay? That's, that's labor on the Sabbath. Or you cannot tie a, a camel driver's knot, okay? That's too big. That's, that's labor on the Sabbath, so that would be working. What about burdens? What, what sort of burdens can I carry? What, what sort of things can I carry? You can carry as much food as equates to one dry fig on the Sabbath day, or the equivalent to one swallow of milk. How much you can swallow in one gulp. That's how much milk you can carry on the Sabbath day. You see, they invented these laws, laws like this. Um, you can't lift a chair on the Sabbath day. So you better make sure the night before that your chair is by the table, otherwise you're going to be standing up eating on the Sabbath day. All right? And you cannot lift up a child on a Sabbath day because that's working. So if the, if the child is upset and needs affection, sorry, you've got to wait till tomorrow. You see? And on and on it goes. They, they invented all these laws. Uh, if, you, if you carried a needle in your garment, you were carrying a working tool on the Sabbath day. You broke the Sabbath. You need cleansing, you see? You need to cleanse yourself again. Wash yourself. If you, if you wore a brooch, same thing. In fact, you know, the, the, the commentators, I didn't make this up. This is all from those that have studied the laws and the traditions of the elders that are carried over even to this day. Okay, so don't laugh at this one, but if you happen to have a, broke, a wooden leg, you've got to take it off on the Sabbath because that's carrying a burden around with you on the Sabbath day. Even take your dentures out because that's carrying a burden on the Sabbath day. You're getting the picture? If, and this will, uh, uh, please don't shoot the messenger, ladies. This, this law was for ladies. You're not allowed to look in a mirror on the Sabbath day. Why? Because you might see a gray hair there and you'll be tempted to pull it out. That's working on the Sabbath. Now this, can you understand how the Sabbath became a burden for the Jews? And, and how Jesus came to set us free from that. You can understand also how I hate religion. Because people, you know, so when I go home, my family are not Christians. And they, they say this saying, which I hate. You know, oh, Ken's religious. I say, look, call me anything, but don't call me religious. You know, I'm not religious. That's one thing I'm not. Then you explain the difference. Jesus did not come to start a religion and put us into bondage under this kind of thing. He came to set us free. We've been singing this morning songs, I don't know if you noticed, about our chains being broken and, and, and us being set free. Jesus has done that. He set us free from that kind of thing. Oh, by the way, another thing, just in case you do want to be under the law, <laughs> if you've got a sore throat, if you've got a sore throat, you can swallow some vinegar, if that will help, but you cannot gargle because gargling <laughs> is working on the Sabbath. And on and on it goes. There were thousands of laws like this. You say, who wrote these laws? These, the elders or the scribes, they wrote them. So they are the legalists, right? And the Pharisees kept them. They prided themselves in, they were the self-righteous. So you've got the legalists, the, the elders and the scribes. You made up all these laws. See how legalistic they can become and how much law they can put you under. And the Pharisees, they loved to show off, to parade that they'd kept all these laws all these commandments, they, they paraded their self-righteousness 
and uh, love to be noted for how well, they, in fact the word Pharisee means set apart. They, they, you know, they said we are those that are set apart unto the law. And, and so they, they took great pleasure in that. Now here's the, here's the amazing thing, the water pots were empty. The water pots were empty. Just what an illustration of how empty this whole thing is. They needed to be constantly filled because under the law, were, people were constantly needed to be cleansed. Now, friends, Christianity can become like that. We can, we can invent a lot of laws and, and rules for people, whereas the Bible says those that are led by the Spirit are not under the law. If, you, if the Holy Spirit is in you, you don't need people to tell you what's right and what's wrong. He's a Holy Spirit. Amen? He's not going to lead us into sin. He's going to lead us into righteousness. Amen. And, and you don't need to be constantly cleansed. That's the, whole, that's the glory of the new covenant. The glory of the new wine of the new covenant is that he made one sacrifice once for all and sat down at the right hand of God and said, it's finished. All your sins have been forgiven. Past, present, future. You say future? Yes, future. You better believe it because he's not coming back again to die again. One sacrifice, once for all. And the same chapter says he has perfected forever those that believe in him. That's the new wine of the new covenant. Amen? Amen. Now there were six, right? Six of these pots. Six is the number of man. So in other words, this is, this is a man-made invention. Religion is a man-made invention. All that was left of Judaism was of the flesh. God was not in it. In fact, we're going to look at this, I think it's um, next week or, yeah, next week I believe, what were called the feasts of the Lord in the Old Testament in Leviticus. They were called the feasts of the Lord because God did invent them. When John refers to them, he refers to them as the feast of the Jews. All those references show that. They were now the feast of the... God was not in them. God was not in the temple anymore because Christ had come. He was the, the temple of God. The new had come. This is what this is showing us. That this whole miracle is the old is on its way out. The new has come. Amen. So when they ran out of wine, Mary came and told Jesus and sought to exert her parental influence by suggesting to him what he ought to do, directing him. They've run out of wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now the literal meaning there is this. What is there in common between you and me? I have been subject to you as a child, he was saying, but not now. Leave it to me. Don't try to tell me what to do because now I'm in partnership with my father. I always do those things my father tells me. Amen. So realize who you are and who I am. That's what he was saying. He was not being rude, but he was saying that, that his season of subjection to his parents was over. His public ministry had now commenced. And he says this, my hour has not yet come. That's quite a significant statement. My hour, my hour has not yet come. There's seven references are made to this. It's amazing how num the number seven comes up a lot in John's gospel. Seven times he declared, uh, different people declared that he was the son of God. Seven times people recognized him as the Messiah. Seven times, uh, seven signs rather, John chose to reveal his glory. And now there are seven references to this hour. And I've called it the awful hour because he's referring to one thing and one thing only. And that is the fact that he would go to the cross and the sin of mankind would be laid upon him. He would bear the wrath of God and carry it away once and for all. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the, uh, of the world. That's why he came into the world. See, friends, we need to keep that as focused as much as Jesus did because a lot of people think of Jesus as being a good example, which he was, but that's not why he came. He did not come just to be a good example to us. Some people uh, see him as a good teacher, uh, that's good. He is a good teacher, but he didn't come just for that. That was not the main purpose. Some people, you know, refer to the social gospel, the fact that he cared for poor people, the outcasts, the underprivileged and so on. And that's true. But don't get carried away 
down that road because that's not why he came. He came to die in our place. And so seven times he refers to this. He saw, this is why I'm here. This is, the Bible says, I think, he, in fact, he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. He was so set on that course. He knew why he'd come and he knew that there was a time when he, he would do that and a time when he, when he should not uh, do that. So therefore, okay, so that, that's the first time. Here's the second time. Therefore, they sought to take him but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. You see that? Jesus was in control of not only his death, but the time of his death. Second, the third time, these words spoke Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. Fourth time in John chapter 12, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come. Okay, this is the end of his teaching and so on and the beginning of um, his going to the cross, okay? Because chapters 13 to 17 are all about the day before the cross. So in chapter 12, he says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Amen? Much grain. Oh, yeah, we've been seeing some of that in Africa. And uh, for 2,000 years, that one death has produced so much grain. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Wow, he could have got out of the cross. But he said, no, that's why I've came. I've come, why I've come. And then John 17, his prayer to the Father. Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, and now has come that you will be scattered, each one to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. And then, sorry, in that prayer to the Father, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. And so that Jesus was so focused on why he had come and the main purpose. So let, let's us also make that our focus in our ministry. So his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. This is beautiful because Mary received what Jesus said before. She recognized that there was now a difference in their relationship. He, you know, that parental direction was not there anymore. He was now in subjection to his father. And so she said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. This is the new covenant way, the new covenant way in prayer. You know, if you ask for anything in prayer, this is, this is what to do. Just bring it to Jesus, commit it to him, let him work out the circumstances. You know, legalistic people look for formulas so that they can come and then hold God and to, you know, God, you promised this and you've got to do this because you said in your word and concerning your works, command ye me, I'm commanding you to do this. People pray like that. That's not the way under the new covenant. In the new covenant, we're, we're encouraged to bring all our needs to Jesus. Say, Lord, this is my need. This is my burden. This is what I'm praying about. But I leave it to you to work out best. You know what's the best way. Amen. I hope you pray like that. And uh, because you'll be disappointed if you think that God is going to do everything the way you ask him to do it. He won't. He'll do what's best for you because he's an all-wise God. Amen. Jesus told the servants to fill the water pots with water. Now this is important. He is the one who works the miracle. Yet the servants filled the water pots and bore it to the governor of the feast. You see the difference? He was the one that turned the water into wine. But they had to first of all fill the, the pots with water and then go and pour it out to the, 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 you know, the, the governor and also the guests. Uh, what took place... Oh yeah, sorry, let's just go back a sentence there. There was no magic formula. There was no magic formula. He didn't just sort of wave his hand and then all of a sudden it was done. He said, no, fill them up with water. They were still water. And then as they went and poured then the water was turned into wine. So what took place was people or people's obedience to Jesus. 
That's the key. That's all he asks of us to do what he said, not to try to work out the, the results, work out the outcome, just to obey what he says and leave the rest to him. Now God is pleased, like he used those servants then, to use human instrumentality in performing the wonders of his grace. We fill the water pots, he turns the water into wine. We present our humanity to him, he does supernatural things through us. Amen? So every day just come and present your humanity to him and you'll see deity working through humanity. That's the wonder of the Christian life. God does extraordinary things through ordinary people. Ordinary people. In fact, not even his disciples, just servants at the feast. Just servants at the feast. So that his grace might be magnified. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Amen. I love it, you know, when, when people point out my weakness. I love it because I say, I know. In fact, there's so much more you don't know. <laughs> I don't think you're ready for it yet. <laughs> but that's the wonder of God using people like me, isn't it? It's got to be God that's doing it. Because you know it's not me. You, you see my weakness. But the excellence, that, that word mean excellence means beyond the ordinary or extraordinary. God does extraordinary things through ordinary people. The trouble is when God does extraordinary things through ordinary people, ordinary people think that they're extraordinary. <laughs> All of a sudden, they become puffed up. But no, just keep humble. Just keep real. Amen. Present yourself to God. Go on your way and let God work through you. Paul says, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty and base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Amen. Praise God. That includes all of us, friends. All of us are candidates for God doing the miraculous through us. Now, water is a symbol of the written word of God. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but because we're going to get into it in chapter 3 when... Uh, Jesus speaks about being born again, that you've got to be born of water and of the Spirit. I'll bring that out then. But I just want you to know that water is a symbol of the written word. It's a symbol of this. It's a symbol of the gospel. And by it, we bring joy to human hearts. You see, we take the good news in these weak vessels that we are. The water is in, is in these weak vessels. But as we share it, it becomes wine in the life of others, it brings joy. Uh, there's no greater joy that I experience than to get these testimonies, and they constantly come back, of people that have heard the good news through us as a church, as a ministry, as we're reaching out to the world, and they say, my life, I had it again today, somebody uh, shared, my life has been changed by this, my life has been transformed. That's joy, you know, I've got joy in my life now, which was not there before, because of the water, that came through a vessel that was given to him and he turned the water into wine. And notice this, the water pots were filled to the brim. Filled to the brim. These big pots, 100 litres and so more. And he said, fill them all up. God gives good measure, abundance of grace. Look at how Paul rejoiced in that in the book of Ephesians. He says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. See, I, I never cease to amaze at the, the goodness and the grace of God in this life. But you know that in eternity, we will never tire of it. We will discover more and more of his grace and the riches of his grace to us. And throughout eternity, 
will be rejoicing in that. Paul says, to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles what the unsearchable riches of Christ. Water pots filled right up to the brim and overflowing. And then this verse that we love so well, Ephesians 3 verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with what? All the fullness of God. That's the Christian life. It's an abundant life. And uh, we'll never exhaust the riches of his grace. Now it says at the end, this beginning of signs Jesus did. That's what the new birth is. When you're born again, it's a miracle, but it's just the beginning of miracles. We see God miraculously working in our lives over and over and over again. The new birth is just the beginning of miracles. The, when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. It's interesting, isn't it? It's not just like the high and lofty ones that know, but God reveals these things to his servants, to the humble. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. They say the best for last. And that's what God does. You know the Bible says that um, we've only received like a, a, a deposit, a down payment of all that God has for us. It's just a, a deposit, just to secure it, as it were. But the best is yet to come, praise God. That's why he said, if in this life only we have uh, hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. But there's an eternity that is awaiting for us to enjoy the goodness and the love and the grace of God. So the new, the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. That's the whole point of this miracle. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is a mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Okay, let's finish up. The world and Satan also gives its best first and keeps the worst for the last. Is that right? For example... First, the pleasures of sin. Sin is a pleasure. Of course it is. That's why people are tempted. But the Bible says that about Moses that he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What happens at the end of the season? Then we get the wages of sin. <laughs> and when people experience that, they, they say, you know, we weren't told about this. We took the bait. We got drawn in. But it, look, it was good in the beginning, but now it's ugly. It tastes awful, and I want out. But with God, it's the opposite. The path of the just is like the shining light or the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. It gets better and better and better. And then we finish with this. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. He revealed his glory and the disciples put their faith in him. In contrast, the ruler was amazed and did not know what happened. He just knew something had happened. He didn't know how. But the disciples and the servants, they knew. And the disciples believed in him. That's why he does these signs, that we might see the glory of the Son of God who's come to us, to us, to us, to you and to me, not just kind of to a mess, but he's come to us to draw us to himself, to show his glory to us and to fill us with the new wine of his love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this passage and we thank you, Lord, that we live in the new and not the old. We thank you, Father, for the new wine of the new covenant we thank you for the riches of your grace. Lord, we pray, continue to fill our lives with your wonderful wine of joy and love and peace, blessing, favor, goodness. 
oh God, and the revelation that yes, you are indeed the living water and the bread of life. And that if we eat and feast upon you, we will never hunger and thirst again. Fill our lives, we pray, this coming week. Help us to know more and more satisfaction and joy and fullness in Jesus. We ask it in his name, everybody said, Amen. Amen.